Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. It is so good to see everybody here this morning. And you just look absolutely gorgeous. I just enjoy so much. When I first come in, there's generally not anybody. And then all of a sudden you turn around and look at all of the beautiful faces. It's so fun to be with you. And we have some treats for you after the service. So we hopefully will be able to have an opportunity to chat and be able to talk, and you can find some time to be with your friends. But also, there's an opportunity for you to be able to take your picture with your family. Now, if you're here today, and you're a mom, and your kids are gone, well, just find some kids. Borrow somebody else's kids and take your picture, okay? I would just recommend that you at least get in front and take some pictures. And if, if you're, a, you're a kiddo and your mom isn't here, well, find a mom. There's plenty of us that go around, and I'm sure we'd be happy to stand in as your surrogate mom. It is so good to be here together, and I love the opportunity we have. Online family, thank you for joining us. I just want to do a shout-out to my mom. She's 95 years old, and I think she's watching right now. Happy, happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. <clears throat> my 95-year-old mom has been praying me through life, and she hasn't stopped, and so I'm very thankful for that. There is a woman that I would like to just uh, give you a little bit of a story about her background. Her name is Emma Jane, and she raised four children as a widow during the Depression. And of those four children, there was one that in particular was, he was a rather cantankerous kid. He uh, had challenges, and he walked a life that was very, very hard. Emma Jane had prayed her family through life. She prayed food onto the porch step, literally when there wasn't any food to be had during that time of depression. And in those moments, she prayed for her kids, and she prayed that they would come to know the Lord. Well, unfortunately, as she was on her deathbed, every single one of those kids wasn't following the Lord. They hadn't turned to him yet. They hadn't been following him yet. And Emma Jane, she gets a hold of the youngest son, and she pulls him down by the collar. She's on her deathbed, and she pulls him down, and she says real close, she gets eye to eye with him, and she says, you know where I'm going, and you know what you have to do if you ever want to see me again. And with that, she passed on. It took years for this young man, years for him to turn. He had everything going on in his life from from alcohol to smoking to profanity to lust. He cheated on his wife. He had a child. And at the age of 40, he was diagnosed with leukemia, and he was told he had very, very little time to live. In that moment, he went to what we call revivals. Does anybody know what a revival is? Ah, there's a few of us. Let me explain to you. Revivals are those meetings that go on at night, and they can be at churches, and they would bring in an evangelist, someone who would speak the gospel with the intent of helping people find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they would go on sometimes for weeks, weeks and weeks. This gentleman, this young man, he showed up, and he walked the aisle because he knew he was dying. That young man at 40 who was headed towards death, left all of his life behind, the the lust and everything behind, and he was healed in the name of Jesus. And he walked his journey from that point forward, following and serving the Lord. His name was George Kikasola. And I lived across the street from George. And George and Margaret had a home where they literally had a revolving door. From 5.30 in the morning to sometimes 10 o'clock at night, people would walk through their door to receive prayer and to receive the truth that God had for them. That's who George was. George was married to Margaret. This was his second wife. And Margaret was what I would call a little bit crunchy. What I mean by that is she was a little rough around the edges. She had been a stockbroker, and as a stockbroker in the early days, as a, as a woman, that was a hard place to be. That was a hard environment, and she hadn't been following the Lord either, but she had just received Christ. She and George married, and then all of a sudden, under the tutelage of George, she became a woman that was soft, malleable in the hands of God, and she began to pray for people. This is my heritage. 
My heritage of following the Lord comes from my biological family, yes. But it also comes from a woman whose name is Emma Jean. And the bloodline flows down to me through her son, through her son's wife, onto me and Dennis, and then it flowed on into my kids. And they learned how to be people of prayer. This is what spiritual parents do. They walk the journey, they let people in, and they watch them. And they, they speak truth. And I want to invite you today to consider that just maybe, just maybe, he's inviting you into more, to become spiritual parents and the spiritual people that he has raised you up to be. We're going to look at this idea that a spiritual mother is a woman with authority who lives under God's authority. That's really important process for us to understand and walk in and journey. It's, it's imperative that we remember we are women of authority who walk under spiritual authority of God. And it's in that place that we're going to take everything that we're going to talk about, what it looks like to be a spiritual mom under that truth and walk it out. A woman under God's authority, first and foremost, is a woman who understands she has eternal significance. She is walking an eternal journey that will never end. And she understands that her journey has others to bring along beside her. I love this quote from Tony Evans. And it says, a spiritual woman, she knows to grab heaven, how to grab heaven, apply it here on earth so life becomes better for everyone under her influence. She grabs heaven. She grabs kingdom truth. She grabs it and she holds on to it and she applies it to life. And in this place of walking the journey on this earth, everyone who walks in her presence, who sit under her tutelage, know that they have come in presence with truth and goodness and kindness and the love of God. 2 Timothy 1.5 tells us these words of truth that Paul is reminding Timothy is in his heritage. Paul is reminding Timothy of the truth of all that has been given to him through two very important women. So before we go on, I want to remind you, as a woman, you have the capacity to speak good truth into the hearts and lives of sons. Do not go and abdicate your role just because you're a woman. Do not abdicate your role to speak truth into the hearts and lives of women. Because there are two women that we see that were absolutely imperative. And interestingly enough, we never see dad mentioned. 2 Timothy 1, 5, and it says this. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it also dwells within you. There was a genuine faith that Lois and Eunice made certain was going to carry out and be carried through to this young man named Timothy. It's a confident trust. It's a trust in believing that God's power, his wisdom, and his goodness is surrounding each one of us and is surrounding them. They surrender their entire self to the truth of making certain that they are planting this truth inside of Timothy. Timothy did not come to genuine faith other than by accident. He didn't come by accident, but he came through the grandmother and a mom who engaged, were committed, faithful, and intentional in making certain Timothy knew whose he was in the Lord. God's plan has always been that there would be a family. The church has always been intended to be a family. You and I, we have moms. We have biological moms. And those biological moms, if we were blessed and if they knew the Lord, they planted things within us. But when that didn't happen, 
I promise you, God has had a spiritual mom in your past to speak to you, to lead you, to encourage you, to prod you on in the truth of the Lord. You see, that generational thing, it is both biological and it is spiritual. There is a biological bloodline. There is a spiritual bloodline. And for those of us, we must remember, please, please, I, I implore you to remember that as spiritual moms, we give to others outside of our bloodline. We do that because that's what God has called us to do. Spiritual moms, they pass on the lessons and their stories and their experiences when God was faithful in their lives and in their past. He, and they do so to pass it on to every next generation. Psalm 145 says this in verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty and remarkable acts. Spiritual moms, they leave a trail of generational blessing behind them. Spiritual moms, let me say that again. Spiritual moms leave a trail of generational blessing behind them. For all who come in their, in their, in their presence, they leave the truth that is generationally a blessing. Spiritual, a spiritual mom is a woman with eternal significance with her eyes on eternity. She knows that the job before her doesn't happen in a day. And she is willing to invest all the time, the energy, and the focus to be able to speak into people's lives. Spiritual moms also live under God's authority and they live a life that is worth imitating. Now, that might be a little bit frightening, and I understand that. I totally get it. There are moments when I want to go and say, nobody needs to repeat what I just did. Nobody. Please, nobody repeat what I just said. Nobody repeat what I am just doing. But over time, the question is, am I progressing? Am I a woman? always ready to take my next step of surrender and submission to God. And that's who he calls us to be, not perfect, but submitted and surrendered. I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 17. It says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, this is Paul. I want to remind you, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. This is a truth that I believe is really imperative for us. And I find it amazing that in a Corinthian church where there's no social media, they had 10,000 teachers. Lots of people telling you how to do your stuff. A ton of them. And today in our society, we have hundreds of teachers. And they get on social media and they have their platforms. They call themselves influencers. And they have the capacity to speak to us. They're celebrity Christians this day. And there's nothing wrong with the truth that they're, they're bringing. But Paul wants us to understand we could have thousands upon thousands of teachers and never have spiritual moms. And there would be a void in our life because someone isn't speaking face to face, eye to eye, truth to truth, because we can hide from a thousand instructors, but we don't hide from spiritual parents and especially from a spiritual mom. So it's really, really true and important that we find those spiritual moms for ourselves. And let's go on in that scripture. It says, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying, I gave birth to what has started in this church. Therefore, I urge you, and he says these words, imitate me. Imitate me. Paul must have had an incredible confidence as he has submitted time and time and time again to the Lord to be able to say, for the good things you see in my life, imitate those. 
For the things when you see something good that is being grown inside of me, remember, that's not my flesh. That's not my capability. But that's the Father, and that's the Lord, and that is our Holy Spirit, and he is at work within me. That you can trust. Imitate that in me. Imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son to the Lord, who will remind you of the ways of Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Spiritual moms disciple other women. They are a powerhouse of truth. They are a powerhouse under the complete and perfect control of God himself. They know that they have a power that is under his control and they impart a faith that is motivated by sacrificial love. They give themselves up for the ones that they love and they care for. Margaret, George's wife, she was one of those women that imparted her truth into me. I can't tell you how many times over the course of ministry I was about ready to quit. I was about ready to walk away. And the Lord would prompt me and remind me, call Margaret. Call Margaret. Kathy, call Margaret. Mother Margaret became that woman for me. And she would say the hard things to me. She called me out on my my stuff. She really did. I love this story about Margaret. She She was sitting in the front row of the church where she had attended church. And there was a gentleman that was getting ready to become the pastor of that church, which was a good friend of ours here from Wichita, and he was headed to Florida. We told him, hey, look for, look for Margaret. He didn't know who she was. He didn't know what she looked like. But he walked down the center aisle getting prepared to preach the first Sunday of his, of his time there. And out sitting in that chair is Mother Margaret. She grabs hold of his hand. She pulls this six-foot something, huge giant of a guy down. And she looks at him and she goes, you're not one of those professional pastors. You are a called out pastor. She would call us out on our stuff. She could see the things that that we were doing. She could see the places where the enemy was messing with our heads. And she would call us out. But I say that to say, she loved me enough to do it. The love that the Lord had had put within her for people was absolutely imperative for the hard things she had to say. As a woman under God's authority, we must know our mission. Matthew 18 or 28 verses 18 through 20 is the mission of Jesus Christ. And it was for all women. And it says this, Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Help the people learn of me. Help them to believe in me. Help them to obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you forever perpetually, regardless of the circumstances you may find yourself in, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Spiritual moms fight the deconstruction of faith in our time. There is a deconstruction of faith upon our young people. The enemy is out to deconstruct their faith. He is placing doubts. He is placing uh, evil things before them. And a spiritual mom is out to fight the battle over your kids' faith. We know that our job is to is to pray them through. We know that our job is to speak the truth. We know that our job is to follow him with everything within us. And while the the church seems to be losing our young people, I promise you, there are young people in our midst who want the truth and who need you. They are 
desiring to have women speak into their lives, both young men and young women. There is more than what we can do. And it is time we all stand up and step in. It is time. We need you. You are not too young, nor are you too old to stand into the truth and the place of being a spiritual mom. So let's do this. Let's fight this, this battle and this journey that the enemy has put into it, into this day and age. A spiritual mom, she stays in step with the Holy Spirit. That means she walks at times. That means she runs at times. That means she stands still at times. Because she is going to walk as fast as the Spirit leads. She's going to run as long as the Spirit is leading her. And when the Lord says, stop and wait, she will stop and wait. Because she has heard the voice of the Savior. She has heard the Holy Spirit speak. Galatians 5, 25 says this. If we claim to be, live by the Holy Spirit, in other words, if we're claiming to walk and live by the Holy Spirit and all that he is saying to us, we must also walk by his Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, a moral courage, and our conduct that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm not strong enough to do that on my own. I ain't got what it takes. I don't have it. I am not capable of walking in godly character unless it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we all need him. We must be faithful to God's word, living in this foundational truth in these ever-changing and turbulent times. I promise you, the things that you thought would never change will. Anything on this earth, the things that you thought would never change, they will. But I promise you, God never will change. He is always faithful, and he will always lead. He will always carry out his promises in your life. I promise you that when you lean into his word, he will take you through the toil and the turmoil and the turbulent times. A woman who walks in the, in the spirit is wise. She can, she can know the truth, and she can understand the times. She has her eyes on the horizon. She is preparing her household for what is to come because she can see. She knows the truth. She knows the time, and she gets ready. She humbly calls you out. She encourages you into the more that God has always had in mind for you to be because she can see it. She doesn't just see the, the stuff. She doesn't just see the challenges. She doesn't just see the things in the flesh. She sees the things that God has spoken over her kids. And she calls them to the better of that. That's who she is. She wrestles with God openly, all the while being very anchored to Christ. She doesn't hide the truth of where she's challenged because she knows that some of the best training we can give our kids is to wrestle in front of them with God's spirit and power upon her. If we go and pretend that everything is wonderful, we have left our children with no capacity to handle the trials of this world. We must wrestle with truth and in front of and with one another. We must come out of hiding. A hidden woman is not a powerful woman. A woman who stands in the presence of God is powerful. And that's who we are. She's a truth teller. She confesses when she screwed it up. Like big time. She confesses when she messed it up. And she seeks for, he, for forgiveness and restoration. As a woman under God's authority, spiritual moms do the will of God. I, I think this is such an important scripture. Matthew 12, 46 through 15, we see Jesus actually talking about who spiritual moms really are. 
And it goes like this. He, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and brothers, his biological mothers and brothers, they stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my brother or who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, here, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. These are the people who we have family with. Remember, the church is our family. And these are the people that we have family. Her heart is aligned and in love with King Jesus. And she follows him all the days of her life. A spiritual mother who lives under God's authority impacts and imparts spiritual truth. Titus 2, 3 through 5 is a great teaching that Paul gives about the church and fathers and mothers. Now, the reason why I'm reading this is because it's really important to understand that the very things that God calls spiritual fathers to are the very things that he also calls spiritual mothers to. So let's read that. Titus 2, 1 through 5. But as for you, Paul is saying, teach the things which are in agreement with sound doctrine, things which produce men and women of good character whose lifestyle identifies them as true Christians. Notice I said true Christians. Not in name only but in action, word, and deed. Older men, you are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. In other words, you're to be Christ-like in your character. And here's where we turn the tides and we see what it means for a woman. As a woman... You're to be all of that. All of that. And I have to believe he believed that women could just handle more than men can. I'm sorry. Guys, I love you. Really, I do. I do. I absolutely do. But here's what he goes on to say for women. Likewise, similarly. Older women, similarly, as the men have this mandate of godly character on them, you similarly have the same mandate. And you are to be reverent in your behavior. You're not to be malicious gossips. And a malicious gossip shows up when there's comparison and competition between women. And she feels lack of confidence. So the malicious gossip gossip thing is to be taken off and replaced with confidence in Christ. Nor is she to be addicted to too much wine. Notice it didn't say she couldn't have any. Didn't say that. It just said she couldn't be addicted to too much. Okay? Ladies, you hearing me? Okay. She is to teach what is right and good so that they may encourage the young women to tenderly love their husbands. Not beat their husbands not tongue lash their husbands but to tenderly love them to tenderly love their children not beat them up not tell them all the things they've they've done wrong but to love them and call them forward into the fullness of all that they can become. 
We're to be sensible. Pure. Makers of a home where God is honored. We set an environmental tone in the home for places where God is lifted up. We're to be good natured. Should be able to laugh at ourselves from time to time. Have fun. Joy that is prevalent in our households. And we are to be subject to our husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So in other words, so that God is glorified. Now, before you want to go and throw rotten eggs at me about being subject to our husbands, let me say this. When a woman is under God's authority, Remember, our big idea is a woman who lives with authority is first under God's authority. And a woman who lives under God's authority can offer a submitted heart to her husband. Because she knows first and foremost who her beloved is she knows that her beloved is Jesus Christ who gave his life for her. And she knows that he is the one who has all power to make anything happen and change and bring glory and good to his name through her husband. It's frightening. Believe you me, it can be frightening to submit to a husband. But when you're first submitted to Christ, I promise you, he will carry you and help you do it. I promise you. Why is that so important as a spiritual mom? Because you have youngers watching you do it. They may be your own daughters. They may be your own sons. And they may be people outside of your biological line. But they're watching you in your submission to the Lord and how to submit to a husband. Friends, I understand it's hard. Especially if you've, if you've had any challenges and abuse in the past. I understand. And I understand that these words are hard. And it's going to take some healing in your life to be able to walk that journey out. I get it. But I promise you, there is healing in Jesus Christ. I promise you. Proverbs 31, 10 through 12 says this. Who can find a virtuous wife? I would even go so far as to say, who can find a virtuous friend in a woman? I would go so far as to say, who can find a virtuous sister in another woman? I would go so far as to say, who can find a virtuous mother in another woman? For her worth is far above rubies, and the heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil. All days of her life. You want to why that is important? Because it's what people are watching. It's what those behind you generationally, spiritually, biologically are watching to see you walk that journey. You may not see yourself as a spiritual mom, and I understand. I get it. When Margaret passed away, I felt like I had lost my oak tree. She was the woman I would run to. I would come underneath the righteousness and her, and her goodness. I would run to her. I would call her, and she would be there for me. And I felt like when she passed, I lost 
my oak of righteousness. And I said to the Lord, how can I go on? How can I continue forward without her praying over me? And the Lord told me this word. It's time, Kathy. It's time for you to be an oak of righteousness for someone else. So how do we do it? Well, if you're not assured of being a spiritual mom yet, let me just ask you to take the first step of being a spiritual friend. Let me ask you to take another step, potentially being a spiritual sister. And as you take it step by step by step, and you submit day by day by day to the truth of God, and you and you grab hold of the word, and you pray, and you receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I promise you there will come a day, you may not even know when the transition happened, but you will stand and you will see a wake of blessing behind you because you stood in the truth. Stand in the truth. I invite you. I implore you. People have thousands of teachers but few spiritual moms. So rise up. Let's do this. Let's be this. Let's walk this out together. Your next step is this. Go and find your people. And what I mean by that is, if you're a daughter looking for a spiritual mother, go find her. Go look for her and ask for her help. If you're a spiritual mom and you know you've been given gifts and God has planted things inside of you that you're to to release and let go and let, let God multiply it, ask God to reveal who you can just come alongside. And the first invitation is, hey, you don't want to say this. Do you need a spiritual mom? Don't say that. Don't say that. Do not say that. Just go be a spiritual mom and love them well. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today and the blessing that we have. And I thank you for the invitation that you have given us to seek out those who have gone before us so we can learn. And equally for those of us who have a little bit of experience, as we've wrestled with you, Lord, that we can just give it away. Father, I ask that you would pour out your spirit upon every single woman here today and bless them to stand in your presence and bless them as they journey as spiritual moms and spiritual daughters. Encourage them, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship? And the prayer team will be here to receive you. If there's anything that we can be praying for, please, please, please come and pray. And we would love to just journey with you as as we take this time to pray together.